Good the, the, this is a pretty specific question. I wonder if you if your system will answer it. Um, suppose yes. I have a closed curve in space instead of a, a just an arbitrary closed curve in space, and yes. I imagine an electromagnetic wave propagating around that circle to produce an electron that's uh, something like an electron that's related yes. to that closed curve rather than just a tight circle the way you're thinking about it for the electron. Yes. Then we could get generalized electrons in that sense that would be yes. associated with arbitrary loops embedded in space. And yes. I wonder if your system uh, can handle articulating the solutions to such things and what they would be like. Yes, it, it can. And this is something that I had intended to keep under my hat. And I've been thinking about it for 15 years. But um, we had a situation arise last week, or a bit before last week, that there's this project called Sapphire, which I recommend you all look at, because I think it's the future of energy. These guys have been looking at plasma reactor, and what they found is they found a huge amount of fusion energy coming out of it. Now, uh, people have talked about cold nuclear fusion, all sorts of things before, but this thing is producing huge amounts of power, in megawatts, from 180 watts of input. So clearly fusion is happening. Now, the reason I, I then heard about this from Arnie, but I worried that precisely the kind of thing that Lou has just asked, leading on from the question he's asked, might be happening there to a certain extent. And I think it is. And that then poses the same kind of dangers of ignorance that Mary Curie had when she was playing with radium before she knew that radium was that radiation was dangerous and it killed her. Now, I didn't really particularly want these guys to die, especially when I had a look at some of the things they were doing. So I phoned them up and explain to them that they might be doing something like the question which you just asked. But I think it's very specific. I think we might want to be a little bit careful that this has been recorded in public at the moment. I think there are um, patents to be drawn up on this. I think, but I'm going to answer the question as well anyway, just why not? Uh, but, but we might have to cut this bit out, Arnie, if that's okay. Right. Thank you. The, you see, the, the, the point of oh. my question has to do with what would happen if your photon one went the, around one of these guys. That is a proton, my friend. That is a proton. Uh, the, you recognize this particular knot as a proton? Uh, I'm asking yes. what would happen if it went around some knot. And then there's going to be lots and lots of different, different entities. There are. But, 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 but Luke, hold the thing up again so everybody can see it, please. That's a oh, it's beautiful just, just a certain yeah. knot, right. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, that's a proton. <laughs> that's a trefoil. Is it? Am I right? I'm, I'm seeing a trefoil. Is that correct? Um, oh, um, I didn't even check whether this guy is a trefoil. <laughs> he might be a trefoil. Yeah. Yes, okay. Well, please, please keep holding it up. I'll tell, I'll tell people what it really is. You see, each of those loops that you have, what it does, it comes up. And it goes right the way around, which is positive pivot, say left-handed, and it comes back almost on itself. But where it comes back in your right. model... You're sorry, saying that a photon going in a trefoil loop will produce a proton? Not quite, but almost. And uh -huh. I'm just going to try and describe what's actually happening. Because in order for a particle to be a particle, it has to be continuous. But it also has to bind. So in a proton, you have three centers of pivot, and they're separated. But they interact through a series of interactions there's an x interaction which if you look in your the knot you just showed you'll see there's a y interaction there's a z interaction and the reason that you get three quarks in the proton is because these things are nearly electrons what they do is they go loopity loopity 90 degrees and then they go so they have some fun over here loop, 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 and they come out so so your your loop there is really each of your turn should really be a double turn because we're still talking about fermions here very nearly so they go loopity loopity over here they go zip loopity loopity over here in a perpendicular plane and then they go zoop and they go loopity 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 in the third dimension and yes they fit together like three-dimensional lego lou you, you you you're being a brilliant guy for turning your microphone off but not so hot on turning it back on when you're talking sorry i, I was <laughs> saying each the three loop the three loops only exist together in the knot, can, just as yeah, the quarks can't be pulled apart. 
you are so brilliant, my friend. I mean, look at that. You've even picked up, I could, if I was in my house or my lab or Martin's house, I'd pick up exactly the same model, I made in stainless steel, as you just showed me. And if you look on the talk that I gave, uh, where did I give the talk? Um, there's an extra talk up there. You'll find exactly that knot sitting there. Who did I give it to, Arnie? I've forgotten who I gave the. It may not be first thing did. Oh, man. Okay, we have a talk on this, but it's exactly your, it's exactly the model you just held up. It's exactly that knot. So uh, the main point is that particles, you see, a proton and an electron have to have the same pivot because otherwise the pivot would annihilate and the thing would fall to bits. So, so everything has to be going around the loop in the same sense, right-handed or left-handed. So, 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 so your loop is essentially, in the, in the electron, of course, it's always in the same handedness because it just goes round and round. But in the proton, it goes zoopsity right-handedness, zoopsity right-handedness in a perpendicular plane, zoopsity right-handedness, and comes back to where it is. But the mass of the proton is related to the mass of the tau meson. It's lighter than the tau meson because of sharing, but it's really three loops almost. So it's lighter than the tau meson, but it's related to it. And in a subsequent talk, I'll give the mass spectrum of these things as well, which I've been able to calculate some elements of as well. So, uh, but that's for a future talk, I think. Louis, can you hold up the model again? John, is this uh, in in uh, K space or real space? It's in K space, just as the electron is in K space. Uh, for everybody else, that's that, momentum that, space. That, that, that shape's space. a little more complicated than the trefoil, it looks like. So that's I don't not think so. Trefoil. I think it is a trefoil. I think it just goes through. It goes. It, I could be wrong there, but it might Not be... Not the simplest diagram. Of Lou will find out. He'll count it for us. But I think that is a trefoil. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Lou, amongst his many other talents, is also one of the leading experts in the universe on knots. Which is why we want him. <laughs> but not just for that. <laughs> Yeah, so I think there's a lot of conversations to be had there about particle spectra and the mass spectrum of particles. But that's for another, that's something we should develop. Uh, I think Louis needs to set up a web shop so we can purchase those knots from you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, any more questions or comments or? Um... Yeah, I had one. Yeah, okay, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to the back room. Yeah, go. yeah, so uh, it was about the talk where you, you said you can uh, switch between different um, uh, um, frames of reference by just having a multiplication from um, the transmitter starting, transmitting, finishing, transmitting, and the photon as the center of mass thing. The thing is more like what Peter was talking about last week in terms of there being a three-way coupling between the elements of this thing. So there's an actual coupling between the operator and the exponent and the multiplication factor. So it's a bit more complicated than just the multiplication. But um, nonetheless, um, and, and what, can, what can you take us through, can you talk us through the physical process in how you think about it in K-space or in real space? Yes, I can. Um, in, in, in case space, I'll do it in case space because that's the space I think on for this kind of thing. In case space, what you're doing is you, you're spalling off a little bit of the internal momentum of the electron or of the electron system. Remember that electrons by themselves can't emit or absorb. You need to have, um, because for an electron, it just thinks it's in free space. So it thinks it's stationary. You need to have at least two of these particles to sit to do that, that, that uh, transmission from one to the other. So the photon is a mutual system of the emitter and the absorber. It's a resonance between the two of them. For the photon, that resonance is at the same point in space time. So what to do is kind of, in your mind, cut out all the oscillations of the photon in between, which are just the same again, the same again, and stick the two, the emitter and the absorber, at the same point in space time. Now what you now have is you have a more complex overlap function of the internal wave function of the of the uh, emitter mediated by a photon through a transformation which is essentially, well, it's either R or one over R, 
that you in fact it's, it's several of those because it's got to emit and absorb even even if you do the Lorentz transformation you're really talking about the whole thing taking place within it depends how far off mass shell you are what that size is but, but um the tend to envisage is all taking place within a, a wavelength like distance of the two things um uh, there, there may be some i don't really know but, here but now, now you're talking like if it was mathematics but in physics it does rotate those extremely amount of turns before no. it reaches the no well, yes that, that, that's what's telling you how far uh, the green photon knows perfectly well that it's had seven billion rotations to go from a to b yes the rotation is happening but the rotation is happening in a perpendicular plane so the, the space the rotation is all happening in the x y plane when the thing's traveling in z so what you can do is you can reduce the thing to as far as asking the question of the bit yesterday remember it goes round and it doesn't quite meet that's right but you know there is a frame where it very nearly meets but where it doesn't quite meet is it goes from like viv's diagram where one end of the spiral is on the emitter and the other end the absorption is on the absorber so um so so but yes there is a real rotation that many times but that's just governed by the equations of motion of the electromagnetic fluid which are maxwell's equations pretty much so then you started with the emitter ha having a uh, spherical um, pattern if you assume it's spherical uh, uh, yes uh, and then the, uh, the absorber having a um, complex polar pattern that is the inverse of it somehow because yes. you invented something that uses uh, the complex number i actually any is, is this, uh, is this maybe oh, no, no, no. i's not i's not in there sorry sorry i used i i used the inversion of the rhyme sorry i did confuse yeah i should practice i like the animation so much that i showed it but i shouldn't have showed it the inversion that I showed was a purely spatial inversion, so no I in there. The, the second, in, where, where I showed the quantum electrodynamic thing, the, the other one was just illustrating the kind of forms that happen when you put an extra dimension in. I have another animation which is proper four properly four dimensional, but I haven't got it working. Um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a JavaScript application and it stopped working a few years ago. And I used to have done it in the window, but it's not working, otherwise, I would have shown that one. Can you somehow the, describe how, how the Electron <laughs> um, expands and contracts. How, how yes, we you're generating a pair of waves. So, so it's exactly the same process as happens in laser up conversion or down conversion. You're generating more than one frequency because what you're doing is you're changing the energy. So that that can be described as a as a, as a generated frequency, as a as a modulation. So, so it's just the same process as you. And put modulation into a uh, electromagnetic wave in any kind of radio transmission, for example. But the thing that I drew had a photon which was a very high energy photon, in, in that it was quite small. It wasn't much bigger than the electron. In reality, electrons are in systems, in dipole systems, because you have to have some flexibility to go from the spherical, because the disturbances and disturbance from spherical. So there has to be some dipoleness in there. Or multipoleness in order to radiate. So you need a hydrogen atom, or you need you need something which is sort of charges and springs. So that's a deviation from circularity. Now, a deviation from circularity means that some part of that field falls off because it's outside the rotation horizon of the objects. So it loses that bit of field. So that element of field is then is then there. But the equation for a field is absolutely through the differential, the energy. Is related to the wavelength. Th 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 those two R's are not really two R's, they're really one R that's been brought down. So, so as you're emitting a photon, what happens is you generate a much lower frequency, a much larger photon. So typical light is what five nanometers is green, roughly. And we're talking about emitting systems that might be an atom, which is roughly 10 to the minus 10 meters. So, so the actual the actual photon is just a very small bit of the field of the electric electromagnetic field which is being lost and that can be carried away that element of it can be carried away which is perpendicular to the magnetic field so the process is a process of creating a little bit of dipole for example field or multiple fields but it's still very difficult to envision what really happens when you when you have 
an absorbing event in your eye from a far galaxy far away? Okay, let, let, let me try to elucidate things by talking about how you generate radio waves, because then everything gets quite big. Imagine you want to generate a radio wave. What you do is you have an aerial, it's, it's a dipole, you know, blah, 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 electrons up and down, electric field up and down. Now, a little bit of that spalls off, because it's changing electric field as you're changing magnetic field. So what happens in the pure photon in, in undisturbed system is that it's purely spherical. It's not oscillating, it's actually a stationary wave because the derivative of the whole thing is zero. So, so in, the, in the Schrodinger equation as well, the S orbital is stationary. It's not really oscillating, it's really stationary state. So when you go to the P, then you have the dipole-like thing, for example. So, um, so, but if you want to generate a circularly polarized radio wave, what you do is you take an antenna, a dipole antenna, and then you have another one at right angles to it, a quarter wavelength along. And what you do is you put them in phase with one another, and that generates a photon which is emitted from both. The photon is generated from both dipoles simultaneously. So, so it's a distribution in the way that you work with the phase array as well. So now I don't understand this stuff very well, but I know very well that it works. So I have I have a. a it's not my specialty in my field, but that's the kind of thing that I'm envisaging. I'm envisaging something like one of those dipole phase arrays. But, but what we have is we have... So, uh, f f what I feel is like the electron goes everywhere in the universe, but yeah. you harvest it from everywhere in the universe. That's right. So, for the electron itself, it's like a plane wave just moving, doing its business, rotating. Every electron has an anti-electron, just what Peter said last week, that there is something which is making the entire universe zero energy. And Peter was calling it a reflection, and I'm calling it an inversion. But um, I think we're talking about the same physics. For every particle, there is an interaction. That interaction is a gravitational interaction at root. Eventually, that's the one that gets left when all the others have gone. That's a negative energy and a positive energy. And that energy is coming from an interaction with every particle, with every other particle in the universe. So, um, so and those are, each individual interaction is very small, but it's combinatoric. So when you do the maths and add up all the negative energies from the from gravitational interactions, then you come up with an R which is pretty much the integral of mc squared over the whole universe. I, I keep getting the wrong reference for this. I keep referencing the wrong person. I know that um, Simon talked about this, but do any of you guys remember who the who, who, who thought that first? Anyone know the original reference? Because I, I I read it recently and realized that the one I've been referring to was wrong. So um, I'm going to be doing it for years. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say he was first, but Feynman is credited with saying it in about 1960. That's yes, I know the Feynman. I know the Feynman one. But I don't know uh, anybody earlier. But it, it wouldn't surprise me if there was. I've been saying for a long time, but I've been getting this wrong that it was um, that it was Petrode. Uh, I need to really check, anyway, in 26 or so. But I think that's just wrong. I, 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 I was at Martin's and I read something else, and it was another earlier one than the final one indeed. Yeah, but Feynman, Feynman certainly did, um, yes, do that. It's in the Feynman Lectures in Physics as well, so it's a beautiful, so it's pretty pretty accessible and a nice calculation. Well, we doesn't like to do the calculation, but, uh, but we did. It is close to zero. I think it's just a version of the Mach principle anyway, so. You know, yes. A good deal older. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Mach principle is just a basically like renormalization. Yeah, it's talking about the interaction in terms of the universal field and everything else. Yeah, but I think what you said last week was absolutely spot on, that you know half of what's happening is happening outside the particle. That, that one needs to consider, you know, the interaction is always from A to B. So you have to consider the integral of all the beads. And that's always got half of whatever's going on in the, in the universe involved in it, because the interaction is always between pairs. It is an interaction. And also, the, the other thing about this is, we were talking about the arrow of time before. I don't know why people don't get this, but it's very simple to explain the interaction, the arrow of time. If you look at anything, the stuff you see is always in your past, and it's always coming from a higher energy object towards you. The direction of time is just the direction of energy flow. 
It's exactly that. Peter, did you see my comment on your YouTube presentation on um, commutator and anti-commutator? I haven't seen it, no. Okay, um, so I com commented like this. So as a summary, kind of, uh, of our understanding of um, what an experiment is, that an experiment, you, you look at the sum of two anti-commuting things. The sum is commuting, but you split their sum into two parts. One is the observer and one is the experiment, right? Okay. Or because you, 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 you try to explain how an observer or an experiment is done by, uh, by saying it's anti-commutive. That's, that's what you get in the experiment, no? I don't think I said anything about experiments. I think I may have said but how discreteness comes from anti-commutativity. Discreteness, anything that you observe must be discreet and discreteness comes from anti-commutativity. So I don't think I said anything about experiments. Okay, well. maybe I generalized your discreteness to measurement. Um, can, is that possible? Can we do that? I don't, you think, can you, do that, yeah. I don't think you can do measurement without anti-commutativity. Because so, measurement is so, discrete, so it must so, involve anti-commutativity. So when we talk about uh, an emitter and absor absorber in uh, the mathematics that um john talks about um the the actual event is commuting nothing is happening from the outside but everything happens inside yeah. no the, i mean the boson is um a scalar object the, the boson the transmitted thing is a scalar object it's it's like the um propagator you know it's it's not um that's never an anti-commuting object, the boson itself. Whereas the fermions, which do it on the anti-fermions in physics, they're the they anti-commuting or anti. So you you mean that the bos the boson, the photon itself, is a boson, right? So the the photon yeah. uh, is commuting, but yeah. the electron and and uh, the anti-electron in this emitter absorber yeah. experiment. Yeah. Are anti commuting. Yeah. Well, the usual way you think about observing and commuting is that if you have two observables, then they don't commute with one another. Like position and momentum in that order is different from momentum and position in the other order. Uh, but, but when you split the world into an observer and an observed, uh, then you're thinking of those two as not commuting. I'm not sure how you're thinking about uh, that. No, not think, not, if they're not commuting, they're anti-symmetric. It's not anti-commutative, it's anti-symmetric. But I didn't, don't think I said that. I said that uh, anything that you observe, which is basically space, has to be um, anti-commuting in, in principle because you can't observe discreteness without anti-commutativity in some way. Uh, yeah, it's what Joachim was thinking about that I was wondering. He he said that he wanted to think about observer and observed as anti-commuting, and I didn't know what he meant by that. I know you didn't you didn't formulate it that way. So the question is to Joachim: What did he mean by anti-commuting of observer and observed? Can you help me out, John? <laughs> you saw my comments. Did, did you, was it completely off for? I, uh, I, I didn't read your comment. I was listening to what you just said. I hadn't seen your comment either, Jochen. I'm sorry, I was busy today because I wanted okay. to see. Uh, I, so I put a comment on Peter Roland's talk about, uh, so an observa observation is that um, you split the community, commute, commutative uh, property into two anti commuted the properties. No. Hmm. I, I mean, the, the non commutativity of, uh, of, of these objects is of several, is of a couple of different sorts. There's the kind of non commutativity that. Um, oh, are you off, Lyndon? Cheers. Take care. Good to see you. Yep. Um, that that um, that um, Lou was talking about in terms of in terms of. Uh, okay. 
there's, that there's a, there are two different kinds of ways that you can do physics. We can do physics with a commutator where we're doing a symmetrized system and we're having a look at the difference between AB minus BA. That difference of AB minus BA, um, clearly if they commute, that's going to be zero. And if they don't, we have something that may act in some way that's unbalanced. And that's proportional to, a well, if you commute with the, with the energy, then that will give you a time rate of change. And there's other commutations you can do with that. When you do a commutation, you're doing a symmetrization of things. If you have a complex system, you lose quite a lot of terms in that complex system. That's one way. Then the other way is you can do something, David Bone talked about this a bit, which is something which has an implicit order ink of events. And in that case, you don't want to be taking a commutator because you're symmetrizing something which shouldn't be symmetrized because it has an order. It has A leads to B leads to C leads to D. And that particular order brings a set of signs with it. Now, the thing about a commutator is it, it cancels one of the kinds of signs there can be. But there's more than one kind of sign. So there's one sign which tells you that the magnitude decreases, and that's one kind of negativity. But there's another sort of negativity, which is the difference between this and this, between one direction and the other direction, between rotating through 180 degrees, which is a vector difference. There's another kind of difference, which is the difference between the handedness and what happens in a mirror, which is another kind of negative. So there's this whole different set of sets of negative. Now you have to be careful with your negatives because, as I said before, I mean, if you do one minus one for feel, that doesn't conserve energy. So you have to think about the physics of what you're putting in, in terms of the commutator or whatever else, in order to really know what the hell you're talking about. So when Lou's replacing, for example, a differential with a commutator, he's doing something which is very conscious and he knows exactly what he's doing. And what he's saying is saying, look, if you do this, you get some of the structure of physics out. But that's not physics. That's just structure of this kind of commutation, this kind of negativity, this kind of switch from going one direction to going in the other direction. Lou, you will jump in and tell me I'm talking bullshit, won't you, if I misquote you? So, um, so, um, so... I haven't seen your comment, and it's probably a very good comment, and it's a very interesting question. But I, but I don't know if I'm answering the question or not either. So so what we talked about talked about when you were away is uh, um, the the process from uh, sender to absorber via a photon, even when it goes across the universe. Doing that. That's directed. Is, That's the directed process. It's the one way process. So it's not appropriate to say AB minus BA there, I guess. Was that, was that the question? No, I mean, for, for me, it felt like, okay, for, if, you, if you look at it from the outside, it has no net um, result, no, nothing you can measure. But inside the system, you can, you can take a cut and say, if I were the observer, I can look at what is affecting me by the sender. I don't know what you mean by saying it has no net result. I mean, that there's, there's, there's no net energy change. There are a set of things that are conserved. But the result is that something has moved somewhere else. That energy has moved from A to B, from hot to cold, thermodynamics. So there is a change. There's an, right, it's, it's not that there's no change. And that change can be measured from outside because it will appear in the degree of disorder, for example, in the entropy. So I think there are two what, processes. What happens with the... What happens with the um, pivot, the root energy? You have only the sender's root energy and you have the receiver's root energy. What there is nothing in between, because just, it's just okay. a photon. Or is it? it, it no. Well, no, in my, if, we, if we look inside my theory and assume that pivot exists, which of course it may not, then what's happening is that the sender has an, a wave which contains pivot, electric, um, quad, quedgehog, magnetic, going around four, just like Garnet was talking about, going around four sides of a box before you get back to where you started from. So four different colors. So you have this process which is going on. Now what happens essentially to the process is a bit of that root energy gets removed. And you can think of that bit as just coming from the pivot. So what happens is the whole process loses energy. It's the same process, but a bit bigger. And that energy gets transferred to a photon. That photon carries away that energy, which gives you the conservation at that point. The, the, the recoiling object goes into a slightly different state, and it throws off a photon. That photon then, in its own frame, um, 
10 to the minus 15 seconds later arrives at its destination after it's crossed um, 75,000 light years. And then it transfers that energy which it's taken out from the pivot of the first one, which is, has been in the interim playing as a photon at light speed, saying, hey, I can make the universe very small. Look at me. I'm a photon. I'm light. So then that stuff, that root energy, is then in the photon. Then that root energy, then the receiving thing, takes that photon and says, hey, I've got what you need to collapse into a piece of root energy in me. But that transaction has taken place for the photon at the same point in, in space-time. So that's the process. The process is one of pivot transfer from hot to cold. I see, I see. It does actually transfer the uh, root energy. It transfers root energy. And this comes back, uh, Joachim, by the way, I thoroughly enjoyed our exchange yesterday where um, I told you, some, where we were talking at cross purposes, and I was saying, and I, was saying I was arguing that the, uh, the pivot was simply, the pivot direction was simply a product of vectors. And you jumped in beautifully and rightly to explain to me what I taught, uh, my own theory, and that in fact I had put in the root mass energy as an extra thing, which you are completely right in. I thoroughly enjoyed being wrong, and you pointing out to me that, uh, that I was being a bit stupid and not really understanding your question, by the way. But this is also part of that. That root energy can exist in pivot, but it can also exist in the vector. It can also exist. The same pivot is traveling around a loop, like Garnet was saying. It's traveling around this four-part wave function. Clickety, 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 click. At 0 to 90 degrees, it's mass. 90 degrees to 180 degrees, it's electric. 180 to 270, it's dual mass. 270 to zero, it's, um, it's magnetic field. So, so it goes round that wave function I drew is a continuous process of transformation from one thing to another. And, and that transformation process can have bits added to it at any point. It's the electric field that does the, uh, that does the um, transfer to pivot, but then the whole thing just goes rebalances. So, oh, got some, and the whole thing just gets sucked into the uh, rapidly. It's a harmonic transfer. It's, a, it's, it's like what happens in the oscillation of a musical instrument, except what we're doing is we're looking at a harmony between an electron internal vibration and a very much lower frequency photon. So any, any musical instrument will transfer energy from the fundamental to other things through resonant, vibra resonant harmonic vibrations. This is a resonant harmonic vibration through space and time and across space and time. So if, if that original photon came from, if the photon came from a hydrogen atom that collapsed uh, one shell from excited state to uh, the base state, and then it met a system that was not the hydrogen atom. It didn't excite the hydrogen uh, electron, but it excites something else. Uh, then it doesn't necessarily need to be exactly the same root energy, uh, the P0. It can be contained in the field instead of in root energy. Yes, and it can be, and it can be contained in gravitation as well, the way of pumping energy to the edge of the universe. So what can happen is, Imagine that you emit a blue photon and it gets absorbed as red. Well, that looks as though that hasn't conserved energy, right? So because if, if the thing that you're absorbing is moving away rapidly, like a, like a red shift, then, then you could emit a blue photon and then you could absorb it as red photon. I see you have the same sort of problems or, or solutions that I have. They're wonderful, aren't they? But <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, I need um, to take her to bed. It's really interesting. I've, I will... Uh... I will listen into the FAQ afterwards. Yeah, okay. yeah. We, can, we, we should put together a discussion. You know, we're just taking too long tonight and it's getting into. But it's a pleasure talking to you about this and, and uh, yeah. very good question. And thank you. Yeah, we'll continue. continue. Yeah. Bye bye. Right, we've now got the heavy maths crowd. So, you've got any really hard questions for me, gentlemen? <laughs> it's just an interjection. Here's what that uh, model turned out to be. It's not. It's a little more complicated than a trefoil. <laughs> okay, well that's good. Um, okay, for the proton, the proton for me is at root trefoil. You can so send a photon good. around that one if you want. Yeah, well let's do it. Good. Okay, hold it up a bit higher. I can't see the bottom of it. Yeah, you, you see what it is. It's a trefoil, but then uh, then it rethreaded itself a little bit. It went around and threaded through itself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we need to sit in a room. Uh, what did you make it from? 
Let, let's, well, let's I never make, made let's... I never made this. So I, I, either somebody gave this to me, or else yeah. I bought it in a museum store. Um, it's a nice mm -hmm. model. Um, it is. It, it was made for artistic purposes, and probably the person had no intention of making one knot versus another knot. Yeah, it just made something he felt felt right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. But, but, but the photon, um, photon it's been around for a long time. If I if I knew what elementary particle it was, that would be better. <laughs> well, I have to get my hands on it, but but I think that in fact most of the elementary particles are quite simple. I think that it, it, at least in my model of of, um, of quarks, pretty much everything consists of either a left-handed loop and then a right-handed loop in what's essentially a figure of eight configuration. They're the mesons or it consists of three right or three left-handed loops arranged in x to y, y to z, z to x, in that, because that's the only way to match three right-handed loops. But, but the loops themselves are usually, or should be much more complicated than just a single turn. Because they, ha because they, have, to, they have to be bound, you have to have some, some system which is holding them together. But they're weaker than the electron because they're more diffuse and more dispersed. And also they have these bits that you can pull apart. And also, I, I was a high energy physicist, I was an elementary particle physicist. I banged muons at 200 jev, like sort of uh, uh, a muon's roughly 100 mev, so, uh, so, so something sort of 2,000 times the mass of the muon, mass energy of the muon, in a muon, into protons. And what comes out is a spastic hamburger of everything. You, know, you just get thousands. You know, the proton blows up, but the muon's unscathed, it just bounces off. Hard shell, not touched at all, smashes them to bits. So, uh, so, um, so the protons are much wimpier thing. I mean, just it's just obvious. I mean, you just keep banging the rocks together. You just you bang these rocks together. One breaks, the other one doesn't. Which one's the weak one? Mm -hmm. I, I don't get why people don't worry about that. And uh, complementary anyway. strengths. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. But the resonance in the hydrogen atom between the electron and the, and the proton, the electro-proton then, is very beautiful because what, you, what you're getting is you're getting the, com the Compton wavelength of the electron is much larger than that of the proton, obviously. It's got much 2,000 times, 1,800, whatever, times the mass. But the de Broglie wavelength in the hydrogen atom is identical for the proton and the neutron, and the proton and the electron, because they're rotating around one another in, in a sense. They've got the same momentum with respect to one another. So they have the same de Broglie wavelength. That de Broglie wavelength is roughly 10 to the minus 10 meters, the size of an atom. So they really do complement one another in such a system. And they absolutely cancel the field outside that radius. And that field cancellation is exactly for a hydrogen atom, your 13.6 electron volts. So, uh, so you, you can calculate it just by calculating the, from the radius of the proton how much field is. Uh, is is cancelled by the negative electron and the positive proton. So it's a simple, sim it's a very simple integral, but quite instructive. So that way you can find out the charge radius as well of the uh, of the of the, of the um, constituents of the hydrogen atom. And Viv's talking the stuff that's coming up for you guys that Viv's doing. I mean, Viv's model of the electron and what's happening inside the electron is much simpler than mine. He's much more literal minded about what's happening there. But wait till you see what he's doing with the neutron with the uh, the atoms as well that's absolutely gorgeous stuff so if you see Viv's, Viv's talks in the beginning are um his way of thinking about this and putting things together later but the um talks Viv, Viv Robinson that he's going to give about nuclear science and about cosmology are really pretty spectacular too so um check check him out too if you've got time he did one he did the first one yesterday but I'm really interested in these, in, in the in the ways that things fit together. But not just for protons, not just for elementary particles, but also for. Um, Peter, do you agree that that, 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 that where, where you're talking about reflections and I'm talking about inversions, we're really kind of talking about the same thing? Is that does that make sense in those terms? Well, um, the way I'm looking at it is, any of the reflections. Uh, if you combine them with the original, mm -hmm. then you get a scalar concept. Mm -hmm. Scalar Boltzmann. So you get a scalar Boltzmann structure with any of the reflections. And if you like, if you wanted to literally invert the 
the wave function, put one over it. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can invert it is to get a scalar if you multiply the the uh, the two objects. That's right. So yeah. If I want, so there's three different ways you can do it. it depends yeah. which, which term you use, make pluses and minuses. Yeah. And so, but in each case, you get one over one over the wave function. And in each case, the combination of the two is um, a scalar object, which is okay. what we call a boson. Or a, and that's what a boson propagator really is. It's, okay. it's just a scalar object that is an inversion of this. And as, as mentioned before about that, or mention it again, that if you if you do the the conventional way of doing the propagator for a boson, they call it the Klein-Gordon propagator. Uh, yeah, I know it. But the Klein-Gordon expression is zero. Yeah. Or can, it's zero on the mass shell. So it's zero. So mm -hmm. you get a pole there. But if you mm -hmm. take it, if it's a nilpotent object, then it only squares to zero with itself. With, with any other object multiplied by any, any, any of its reflections or inversions, you get a scalar. Okay. So I think it's the same concept, really. I think it is. I think we're talking about it with different words. You can invert it, you know, mathematically, and you will yeah. get a scalar. I'm glad we're on the green with that one, because it was worrying me a little bit after we had that little discussion after the last week. But um, I think we are on the same. We're on the same thing from uh, with slightly different perspectives. But the inversion, the, scale, the fact that one gets a scalar from this is the essential point. Yes. And then, of course, John, you're walking into the rich geometry of geometric inversions and seeing how that's related to your physics. So, uh, so it's not just the formal inversion; it has to do with the geometry for you in a lot of that's, cases. That's right. And I think you're probably way ahead of me on on, on that, um, Lou. So I think we have a very fruitful discussion to come at some stage on those things. So, uh, so, um, but I'm looking forward to it very much indeed. But yes, exactly that. So in the primitive way that, um, that we've got so far anyway, that's the kind of thing that I'm trying to get my tiny mind around. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Right, gentlemen, I must admit that at this stage, I feel like a, a bit of a drained rag. And I think I see a nice small, I think we should stop recording. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>